So, without further ado, it is my honor now to turn over the podium to our Chancellor, Dr. Randy Woodson, for the official introduction. Chancellor. Thanks, Ken. Uh, good evening, everyone. So this is a, a real honor for me. You know, there, when you think about this university and you think about the people that have uh, started their careers and have been, been impacted by NC State, there's no one that's a better example than Dr. Jim Goodnight. Uh, Dr. Goodnight is a PhD student here and then subsequently as a faculty member, uh, got busy working in analytics associated with agriculture and uh, spun out this uh, little company called SAS. You know, there are people in the world that have the ability to see the future. And uh, Jim Goodnight is one of those. Because if, I'm serious, if you think about the world of 1976 or 1986 or even later, people weren't talking about analytics. Uh, but Dr. Goodnight and his colleagues understood that the time was going to come when we were going to be buried in data and we were going to have to make critical management decisions and critical decisions across the world based on understanding data. And he's built uh, an amazing company uh, right here in Cary that, uh, that does just that. And when you think about the impact Dr. Goodnight has had here at NC State, how many of you have had classes in SAS Hall? Okay, a fair number of you. I suspect a number of you might even be Goodnight scholars. Uh, Dr. Goodnight and his wife Ann support 200, 200 STEM students at NC State with now uh, full ride scholarships, full tuition full room and board, and uh, that's amazing generosity. Also, when you think about a commitment to education, the good nights represent that across the spectrum. There's no one more passionate and probably no one more outspoken about education than Dr. Goodnight. He and Ann have uh, started a school in Cary. In fact, he'll leave here tonight to go to a dinner uh, in celebration of that school, the Cary Academy. Uh, he's been very generous to NC State and always, always focused on helping this state get better. So it's my honor and privilege tonight to be with you and to introduce Dr. Jim Goodnight and his colleague, the CIO of SAS, Keith Collins, who also is a graduate of, of this great university. And Keith is going to have the challenge of, uh, of sort of trying to manage his boss through a fireside chat. And I'm gonna leave because I'm going to honor another one of our great faculty member, Jay Narian from Material Science and Engineering that's getting the North Carolina Award tonight from the governor. Uh, so I'm heading out there and I, I actually think Dr. Goodnight is pleased with that because he loves to talk about the university in ways and not feel encumbered by the chancellor as he does that. So Dr. Goodnight, Keith, Thank you, Randy. Okay. So, Jim, I thought we might uh, start by talking a little bit about this agriculture piece. Is there, was there something that you feel like you were doing unique and uh, approaching the problem right then at that time? Well, our goal was to <clears throat> not have to rewrite programs over and over and over again to, uh, to analyze all this ag data. So um, we began to uh, realize that um, if we um, consolidated uh, in, into, a, into a, a single program the ability to read data in and, and then move it out to, uh, to disk, that fr from that point on we could read it back in and, and run it through any number of procedures. So really it was more a self-preservation than anything else. So. Um, that's uh, one of the reasons. We, we worked in a group called the Experiment Station. There is one at every land-grant university, and the purpose of the Experiment Stations is to help 
uh, design experiments uh, for agriculture, agricultural research, and then to analyze the data. Well, it turns out there's an ag there's a experiment station at every land grant university, and the, the southeast, uh, all, all the universities in the southeast, had, had an association that, that they would get together. It was called the University Statisticians of the Southern Experiment Stations, or, or useless, or we used to call it useless. Um, <laughs> So that was the nickname of the organization, and they met once a year and, and pretty much uh, talked about different things and, and, and partied a lot. Uh, so uh, we uh, actually introduced SAS to this group in 1969, and they all liked it, and they all wanted us to sort of become their uh, development staff. There was no reason for every experiment station to write programs, so they said they're just going to rely on NC State's uh, work. And so that's, that's how we began to get our first uh, group of users. So in fact, they recruited you back, and were you you were working at NASA for a little bit? Well, I got about halfway through my master's program, and I had been working uh, since the end of my uh, sophomore year. That's when I took my first computer course uh, on an IBM uh, 1620. Uh, wonderful! It was a wonderful machine. It was a Base 10 machine. You could actually read it. <laughs> you know, you didn't have to translate Base 8 and all that kind of Base 16 in your head. So. Um, uh, and it was a fixed length instruction set. The first two, first two digits of each um, instruction was, was the op code, followed by two addresses. And boy, it was just a very, very simple uh, concept. Uh, but um, it, was, it was a pleasure program. And of course, we used to program in machine language or, or assembly language. So you really got to understand what's going on inside a computer. And you know, I worry sometimes about computer science today with all the higher level languages they teach that they, they, they don't get appreciation for what's actually going on inside the machine. Now, well, I, that wasn't your question, was it? What was it? <laughs> <laughs> what are we talking about? The, the, the state you did spend some time at NASA, you came back and... and right. Of... Yeah, I, I had um, I started working that summer after my sophomore year after I took my first course. And there was only one course and it was taught by the stat department. Uh, this was before computer science, so I, I predate computer science. Um, <laughs> But I, I had worked, uh, you know, 20 hours a week all fall and spring and 30 or 40 hours in the summer. And I, I was just tired of working and going to school, so I, I decided to uh, go out and get a job and, and leave my uh, master's program. And, and, and I did. I ended up down in Florida working on the, um, on the Apollo program for about a year. Uh, my, uh, my wife's uh, dad was, uh, was terminally ill, and uh, she was spending more time back here. So I said, why don't we just move back to North Carolina? So, uh, I, I, I called back up and said, can I get my job back? They said, sure, come back. And I did, and I walked in. There was my office. I opened the filing cabinet and pulled out the program I had been working on, <laughs> sat down, and went back to work. So, yeah. uh, um, so around that time was when uh, the IBM 360 came out. Was there something that you felt was unique that sort of launched the work you were able to do, talking about not having to rewrite the programs over and over? That well, the 360 was a, was a revolution in that it was a promise by IBM that you would not outgrow that, their architecture. They, they would always have another machine, another machine, another machine with the same architecture. Up until that time, every new machine that came out had a totally different architecture. And uh, all of your programs had to be rewritten for that next, next level. So it, it was more of a marketing promise from IBM that things were going to be the same for a, for a long time. Yeah, so for agriculture, you were, you were dealing with all, taking in all the different data provided a framework for managing that data to drive it through the different analytics. What, so what was the progression to sort of the next couple of industries and what were the type of problems that people were really early on trying to, to attack with analytics? Well, one of the uh, very similar things to agricultural research where you, you've got uh, planned experiments where, where they're laid out very carefully, uh, the pharmaceutical companies also have exactly the same thing when they do clinical trials. They, they establish which patients are going to get a, a placebo or a, another type of treatment, which ones are going to get uh, the, the new treatment. And the, the experiments are designed. So the same analysis applied to the pharmaceutical industry as well. So uh, most of the pharmaceutical industry uh, started uh, using SAS as well. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is, is in 1972, uh, the university lost its NIH funding uh, up until uh, 72, NIH had provided most of the funds for the computers on, on all the co uh, college campuses. 
And, and when Nixon came in, he said, I only want to spend NIH money on uh, research hospitals that have hospitals and, and th that are medical research. So we lost our funding here. Uh, and uh, we came up with the idea of going to, the, to all of our experiment station users and asking them to fund us. So they, they all pitched in and gave us uh, uh, $5,000 a year uh, to, to continue the program. But they said, listen, we also want you to begin licensing SAS to some other organizations so that we don't have to foot the bill forever. So we said we would. And so uh, that's when we went on uh, what is called soft money at the university. That means you are, you are welcome to work here, but you've got to pay your own salary. Uh, that's, uh, and that's what, uh, that's what soft money is. A lot of professors are on soft money. But they're dependent upon the grants that they've got to, to, fund, to fund them and their research. So that went on until 1976. Now, do I remember correctly, um, can we quote ourselves as being one of the first open source companies? Because when you acquired the rights from the university to start SAS, wasn't there originally a, a, a set of open source that was available to anybody that wanted it as you guys took it and then evolved it? Well, we always uh, shipped the source code with our uh, compiled code <laughs> so that people could, could study it to see exactly how we were computing things. We did that up until about 1985 when a small company out in uh, Tennessee decided to uh, use that and uh, uh, use our um, source code to write SAS for, for a VAX computer, which is a mini computer. Uh, mini computers have sort of gone the way of, uh, of horses, I guess, or whatever, they're, yeah. they're, they're, they're gone. Uh, but uh, that was the next phase of computing after mainframes, was mini computers. Mini computers are about the size of a garage uh, excuse me, about the size of a, of, of a, a refrigerator. Lots of wiring inside, and, uh, but, and they, they were great uh, to be um, uh, much less, less expensive and, uh, than the mainframe, and a lot of departmental co departments were buying them to do departmental computing. Um, but um, anyway, after that lawsuit, which we, we won, they, they were found guilty of copyright infringement. Uh, we were able to, uh, we, we stopped shipping source yeah. code. So that was an interesting time. You, you started off with assembler, mostly assembler, some Fortran. Um, PL1 was coming along the same time that the, the minis and the vaxes and everything were, were happening. But you somehow were early in on C and using C to rewrite SAS. What, can you talk a little bit about what that discovery process was like and the decision to, to invest in C to rewrite SAS? Well, PL1 and C are, are very, very similar languages. I think the main thing that PL1 had was a global scoping of variables, so you could use them anywhere and uh, within routines, and it, 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 it would still know about them. Um, but the problem was uh, there really wasn't really good support for PL1 on anything other than the mainframe. Uh, there was some. On, on the mini computers, but then the PCs came out about that time, and we had to figure out, well, how are we going to support PCs? Our users want us to support PCs, and, and let me tell you, that was tough, shoehorning a 32-bit system into a 16-bit uh, processor. It was uh, extremely difficult uh, to get SAS to run, uh, and we had to do all sort of overlays and everything else to try to get, get it to squeeze down to that size. But we finally did, but we decided the best way to do this, since C was sort of the prevalent language for uh, PCs at the time, and, and it, C was available for many, it, it was only mainframes that C wasn't available for. So we said, well, we'll just buy a C compiler company and, and go ahead and rewrite everything in C. So that's what we did. And uh, we, were the, we were suppliers to, uh, to Microsoft, the Lattice compiler. Uh, and, and what we did with it, though, was to uh, we were all basically uh, doing most of our develop development at that time on on Unix boxes or uh, uh, what was that? What, what Apollo Apollo, mm -hmm. Apollo Opera? What was their operating it was similar to Unix? It wasn't no. wasn't quite Unix. So that, that's long gone as well. Um, but we decided, well, why bother compiling it on the mainframe? We'll just compile it on the on the uh, on our Unix boxes that we're using and, and cross compile it and cross-compile it for the PC, cross-compile it for the mainframe. So uh, we had a very good uh, compiler staff at the time, and 
everything we did was cross compiled to other machines so that we didn't even have to move the, the uh, source code off, the, uh, off its environment. So. Yeah, I mean, one of the interesting side effects there was in the process of buying the uh, Lattice C compiler, creating a, a mainframe C, which didn't exist at the time, That's true. turned into a, a very good line of business for quite it some did, time. It did, yes. We, we then turned around and licensed it uh, so that other uh, companies could uh, develop for the mainframe yeah. in C. So that was an interesting set of events going, rewriting to the PC, going to C, um, and along came this idea of trying to create a framework that could run across all these different operating systems delivering the software at the same time, what eventually became the multi-vendor architecture. Um, could you talk a little bit about how that evolution happened, the, the types of, of um, thought processes that went into generalizing the layer and, and getting that work done? Well, we had, of course, developed SAS for the mainframe. We had another group that actually helped convert it to run under VMCMS. That was a virtual machine, uh, CMS. Uh, essentially, you use the mainframe as if it were a personal computer. You, you, were, you, you were the only one on that machine as far as you, you knew. Uh, and we had a group that, that, that worked to convert it to, to run that way. And then we had another group that converted it to run on, on many computers. And so now you've got a huge code base, a different code base for different, for different machines. And when you're a software company, having different code bases is, 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 a, is a boat anchor. You can't move. You got to, every time you turn around, you've got to go convert, do the same thing you did for this code base. You've got to go over and do it for that code base. So uh, we knew that to be successful, we needed to have a single code base. And um, the code at that time was probably, probably three, you know, two to three million lines of code. And we didn't want to have to rewrite that for different machines. So we came up with the concept that, look, let's just write on top of each operating system, let's write a very thin layer, maybe no, no more than four or five percent of the entire system. And then once that layer is in place, we'll drop 90, the 95 percent of the rest of, the, of our software down on top of it. Very similar to what they're doing today with, with virtual machines, with that, with that layer in between. So uh, that was our uh, multi-vendor architecture. It, it worked extremely well. We're able to uh, take advantage of all different hardware, but yet maintain a, about a 95% uh, code base that was the same across all machines. So what's interesting to me is um, what you just described is sort of like the POSIX layer that came around 10 years later. Um, and so there, there are several examples where SAS has been well ahead of, of the market in terms of leveraging technology and moving technology. What would you say about um, how you've built SAS about the talent you've been able to attract and retain and why that's been successful. What is it about, what's the motivator that keeps really talented people at SAS? Is there something you, you think you can put your finger on? Oh, hell, I think they just love to work for me, Keith. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know. But uh, and, uh, honestly, it's, um, it's, a, it's a challenge, you know, at SAS. We don't, we don't let anybody sit back and rest on their laurels. It's always, what are we doing next? We've got to stay ahead of the competition. Uh, so it's a, it's a constant battle of uh, uh, challenging uh, our people in R&D uh, to work a little bit faster, or try to get things out uh, quicker, uh, keep ahead of the competition, uh, take advantage of all the latest new gadgetry that's out there, things like iPads. When that came along, we were blindsided because we weren't working on any kind of mobile stuff because up until that time, the screens were only that big, and who cares about putting analytics on a screen that size. But bam, the iPad comes along, we've got real estate. We need to run on that. So had to, had to have a group to take off and start running on that. But in, in reality, I think in, uh, in, in IT and in, in computer science, uh, I've seen surveys that, that said that the, uh, the challenge of the job is more important than the salary. Salary is important, but it's maybe second to to, to be ch to the challenge, yeah. and we've tried to develop a a, a, a very innovative, uh, creative atmosphere, uh, and, and it's sort of the the culture at SAS to 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 be creative and to be innovative. Yeah, well, I know as a developer when I would go to our users group conference, it was extremely rewarding, um, but also I thought one of the things that surprised me was the way. <laughs> Customers would use our software in ways we never dreamed and use it for much larger problems 
than we might have imagined. What would you say in terms of uh, the importance of scalability and performance to the success of, of our product suites? Well, that's where we are today, facing the challenge of, of big data. And that's, that is an industry buzzword that uh, it's, uh, it'll, it'll fade in another year or two because it's been around for a couple of years. You see, every three years, there's a new industry buzzword. You know, it used to be cloud computing. That was it. We had to talk about that. Uh, before that, it was software as a service. Now it's big data. And I think the next one has come is next, next big term is going to be Internet of Things. That's already starting to appear. So we'll have all sort of venture capitalists pouring money into Internet of Things companies that are going to figure out what to do with it just like they've done with the big data and poured money into that. Well, we started on this big data. We've always dealt with very, very large amounts of data. But uh, it's not only big data, it's big, big computational problems as well. Five years ago, it's been, well, five and a half years ago, I was in Singapore at one of our conferences. And a banker comes up to me and says, uh, you know, they've just installed our risk computational engine and it's working fine, but it ta it's taking 18 hours. And I said, well, he said, uh, we really need to understand our risk profile before the market's open the next day, and this is not going to get it, 18 hours. So can you speed it up? Well, I went back and I, I talked to our, our risk development staff, and after about two weeks, I finally understood what they were doing. Uh, if you're if you're a risk developer, you don't talk much. It's you know just a <laughs> sentence. You know, one sentence is about all you can get out of them at a time. So it took me a while, and I, but I finally was able to understand the computations that they were doing. And lo and behold, it's going to take about two trillion operations to do that stuff. And uh, on a processor that's only running 2 million instructions a second, it's going to take about 18 hours. I mean, we might have shaved 10% off with a little uh, improvement here, a little improvement there, but it, it's still going to take 16 to 18 hours to, to, the, to do the job. So it's very clear that a single processor is not going to do, do the job. We're going to have to, for analytics, go to um, a massively parallel or symmetric, symmetric multiprocessing Actually, what we've ended up with massively parallel symmetric multiprocessing. <laughs> so, because the great thing about symmetric multiprocessing is you get to use all the memory. Everybody in that machine gets to use the same memory. And I mean, you've got to be careful not to step on each other's toes. But if, you have, if you're reading data in that everybody needs to access, you don't have to read it in one time. And then every processor in that, in, 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 on that machine can read, read that data and do what they're supposed to do with it. The problem was that our algorithms are all this single processor algorithms. You know, humans tend to think sequentially, especially in computer science, you know? Well, the first thing I need to do, I need to do this, and then I need to do this, and, and that's how we have always broken down problems uh, in, in computing. How, you know, solving each individual piece un, un, until you're absolutely positive that that's correct, then you move to the next piece and you solve that and so on. How do you do this in parallel? Our minds really don't think that way in parallel. Well, it was the first, one of the first things that it, it dawned to me on is that we have got to build this really large matrix in memory. And we've always done it one row after the other, or sometimes one column after the other, either way. But it dawned on me, you know, it doesn't make any difference where these rows are. They don't have to be all together just because it's a matrix. Why don't we let this computer do the first five rows, this one do the next five rows, this one do the next five rows, so we can build this matrix in parallel and do it very, very rapidly. And that's, that's how we got started in, in our concept of thinking about how do we move our algorithms into parallel modes. And uh, today, that 18-hour problem runs in 12 minutes because we're able to spread it out, we're able to take advantage. And you know, the, um, the chip technology today, uh, Intel is making uh, denser and denser chips. Actually, the chips don't get any smaller, they stay the same size they have for the last couple of generations. I brought one with me. Um, <laughs> Intel gives me these because they, they like you when I talk about their chips. Uh, <laughs> 
But this is a, um, um, an Ivy Bridge chip. Sandy Bridge was a generation before, it was exactly the same size. But uh, the Sandy Bridge had eight cores. A core is the CPU, uh, memory uh, units, floating point units, graphical, everything, everything that makes a computer except memory and, and disk. So essentially there, there were eight, uh, eight computers on, on this chip uh, during the Sandy Bridge era. That was 30, and it was a 33 nanometer chip. Same size chip today is a 22 nanometer in the circuitry inside. And this chip has 15, has 15 uh, cores in it. I think it really has 16, but they hadn't quite got their manufacturing down perfect yet. So it's either 15, uh, but they're shipping 15 right now. And it, it's amazing if you think about it. If you, if you, um, if you, the, the normal server comes with two chips. So now you'll have 30 computers inside each server that can address all the memory inside that machine. So you've got to think of ways to do things in parallel that takes advantage of the, the shared memory so that uh, you're able to do things a lot faster. You're able to do compute, computing a lot faster. You're able to handle much bigger data by, by bringing data into memory and scattering it across dozens and dozens of servers. You know, we can, we can hold 10, 12 terabytes of data in memory. Now, if you buy a server with about, with two of these chips on it, you can put a, a terabyte of memory on it and hang a few disks off of it for about $12,000. Then you run a Red Hat operating system on it, and you've got one heck of a computer, incredible computational powers for extremely small amounts of money. Now, one of my favorites, Dell makes an R, it's called an R920. It's got four of these chips in it, in, in the single server. And on that one, you can put up to three terabytes of memory. So that is just an incredible machine. And uh, we've got a, a number of those at, at, at SAS. And as a matter of fact, we've got, we've, we've got a couple now that we, we can actually wheel around on dollies and take with us. So there are, enough, there are enough compute power to be almost the equivalent of a data center. And we can just throw it on the back of a truck and take it somewhere with us and, and, and roll it out. It's got its own wireless network, so we don't have to hook it up to anything. It's ready to go when we get there. So. Uh, <coughs> Today's computers, the, the price and performance just gets better and better and better. These chips, each, each one of the cores operates at three billion instructions a second. And I said, well, how, well, okay, how many cycles does it take to do a floating point operation? Because those used to take eight or nine cycles. They've got it down to one cycle. Three billion floating point instructions a second. It's just absolutely amazing the amount of circuitry it's going to take to do that. But yet Intel has done it, and uh, the next uh, the, the next generation uh, after this one is where they will improve it. So they have a they, they call it, it's called tick tock tick tock tick shrinks it from the last generation, and tock makes it improve, and then the next tick they shrink it again. So we're at 22 nanometers now. The next generation uh, after this will be down to 15 nanometers, and I think. I'm not positive, I think about five nanometers is about the absolute limit because that's the wavelength of ultraviolet light that they use to etch the chip with. So, uh, you know, after, after about five nanometers, you start getting into the x-ray area and that's just not gonna etch anything, it's just gonna go right through it. So, uh, anyway, we're having great fun as a software company <laughs> taking advantage of these incredible uh, computers that have these incredible chips. And our customers are moving off of a lot of the, uh, you know, the, the more expensive, much more expensive uh, uh, computers uh, and, and moving to what we, we call this stuff commodity hardware because you can buy it. Uh, Intel designs it. They make the chips. Uh, a number of companies manufacture it. Dell, Dell does a good job. HP does a good job. Cisco makes it. Uh, Lenovo has now bought IBM's uh, x86 business. So you know, they're, they're going to be into the business of, of uh, x86 servers. So there's a lot of competition out there, and uh, these servers are just going to get cheaper and cheaper and faster and faster with more and more cores and much, much larger amounts of memory. And we've got to start thinking about 
handling all this tremendous power, a tremendous amount of memory. You know, you talk about the 360 days. Our first machine had 128K on it. Yeah. So, and, and so you hear the passion in his voice, and it is absolutely real. What did it, about what was the ballpark cost for that first right, computer? With Our first, the first yeah. computer that sat by was about $2 million. Right. So and it, it was a used one. So. Yeah. And, and, but it had 128K. So, and it was core. It was core memory. You know, today I, I still find myself calling it core. Back in those days, it was cores. It was these little donut holes. <laughs> and you could open the cabinet and see 100,000 little donuts in there with, with wire going in each direction. And, and it was a ferromagnetic uh, yeah. <clears throat> donut that, 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 that got <laughs> magnetized back and forth. And that's how we uh, had uh, internal memory. Yeah. But you can see right, the, how he motivated uh, he's driving us about leveraging the technology at hand because we can solve such different problems. Right, the size and scale. Problems that we never even thought about. I, you know, in, in, in uh, the uh, banking industry example, they, they, they need to compute the probability of default for mortgages. This is part of the government's uh, requirement that they understand uh, how much value they have at risk uh, uh, at part of their CCAR uh, work that they do. But the, the, the problem is, uh, 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 one of the big banks we work with, they have nine million mortgages outstanding on home loans. And um, to do logistic regression, and logistic regression take, takes in a whole bunch of variables and then tries to predict a number between zero and one. So it gives you a probability that this loan is going to default uh, in, a, in a given period of time. Well, that is a, a nonlinear model, and nonlinear models don't have a solution. You have to guess at something and then do an iteration through the data and then improve your guess and, and do it again, go through the data again, improve your guess, go through the data again, do this 25, 30, 40 times. You've got to read that data that many times to be able to finally come to a, uh, a set of parameters that have converged. Well, back in the, in the old days, we had to read the data in every single time, every single pass. We had to make 40, we had to read the data maybe 40 different times to, 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 the, to do these iterations. And it took a lot, a lot of time. So there's no way you can handle 9 million. So they would subsample maybe 50, 50,000 of these and then build the models on just 50,000 of these loans. Even that would take four or five hours. And then once they've developed the model, then they would go back and apply it to the entire data set. Well, now we say, don't bother, I don't bother sampling. Just do it on all 9 million, and, and it'll, we'll do it in about a minute and a half. <laughs> so um, it, 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 it makes uh, the job of modelers and uh, data analysts a lot easier because uh, they, they they can fire up job after job and test many, many different models and iterate and try different methods and, until they're really happy that, that they have found the very best model that, that they can possibly find. It used to be they would, they would have to give up after five or six tries because it was just taking forever to do it. But now they can do all that. They can do you know, 100 iterations on this in a day's time to try to find the right model that, that, best, that best fits the data. So there's an example of, of doing jobs or problems that you never even would consider before that you now can do with the massive parallel computing. So, and so I'm going to, I'd like to back you up just a little bit, Jim, and talk about, because I want to make sure the audience understands the importance of, of the core of the X prime X calculation, because it's key to so many of the things that, that, that we calculate. Um, and together with that, with the simulations on the risk piece. So you, you, you took a number and you put it out there on the number of computations, but I think the, the story of what that ties together, you're doing the X prime X and then doing the simulations, it really helps people see um, what the set of computations are going on. Well, about everything we do in um, statistics, statistical computations is, is called, a, they're row operations. Uh, you know, when you multiply a matrix on the left time, times a matrix on the right, you're doing row operations. If, if you stop and think about it, 
the first row of you take you take the first row of the matrix on the left and you lay it down sideways beside the matrix on the right and then you multiply each row by that value so it's a constant times a, a vector constant times a vector that's row operation and then you, you add those up a, a lot of people think well it's this times this and this times this and this times this and you know that's how you go through mul matrix multiplication well, you can do it by taking that whole row, turning it sideways, and let that be a constant multiplier of each row. And that's how you need to think about it. This chip has vector multiplication on it. Uh, it has, um, it does, it, it does two multiplies and adds in one cycle. And you know we, we expect to see even more. Then they just m move down two and do the next uh, two pairs and, and, and so forth. But in, so instead of four cycles that it would normally take you to do that vector multiply, uh, or, or to, for each uh, each pair of twos, it, it now is down to a single cycle. Yeah. So understanding that. When you're building an X prime X, it's, it's again, it's vector, it's vector multiplication. You're taking X1 times the first row. You're taking the X2 from the second row, and that's, that's, that's what you multiply that row by. And so these things don't have to be anywhere near each other. They can be scattered all over the place. And then when you invert that matrix to, to get a solution, again, you're using row operations. You don't, it doesn't matter. The rows don't have to be together. They can be scattered anywhere. You just have to have a little vector that tells you where they are. You got to, got to have a little housekeeping to know where they are. So um, it's pretty simple. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so, so you you poked a little bit about the Internet of Things. Um, are you already starting to see in some of your conversations uh, where some of those sensors and some of those feeds you think are going to change um, how we act, what we do? Uh, it, it's uh, let me get around to it a little slower than that. You know, we're, we are working with a, with a lot of sensor data right now. Uh, we work, we're, we've done some work right here with the Freedom Center on, on Centennial Campus, uh, working with Duke Energy. They've got 140, no, it's 100, they have 104 synchro phasers. Now these are not Star Trek phasers. These are <laughs> phaser. These measure uh, phaser measurements in the in the in the electricity that's coming through. But it, it they're measuring 28 different measurements each each time uh, they do the measurements. They're doing 30 measurements a second. And and we're getting that data, and we the, and Duke wants to know tell us when something is going bad wrong so we can try to correct it. So. You know, there, there we're dealing with incredibly fast data. So, you know, you know, big data can also be fast data, stuff that's really moving at you really, really fast. You've got you've to absorb it, do your computations on it, and, and end up with the results in, in milliseconds or, or, or even, even less. So uh, that's one form of sensor. Uh, cars uh, all have uh, all sort of sensors on them you know, 15 or 20 computers on every single car and chips. That's, that's why you don't go poking around under the hood. You're going to blow a chip somewhere. So um, anyway, um, very soon now, all, all cars are going to be broadcasting information about all their measurements, all their meter, uh, all their readings. So, and we're working right now with a trucking company that has 45,000 trucks that are going to send us 30 measurements every five minutes. On each on each engine, uh, speed, location, uh, in, any number of things that they want us to be able to then analyze, help predict failures. That's a that's a one of the key uses of sensors is to be able to predict failures, so that we can say that, and and on the uh, up in the Black Sea, uh, where we, we uh, do a lot, uh, now this is the North Sea, where we do a lot of oil exploration up there. There are pumps. There are like 200 pumps on every uh, on every uh, platform, and if any one of those pumps goes out, it's it's usually critical. So we are able to forecast when each one of those pumps is likely to fail, based on past history and and, and using uh, some of our analytical tools. 
So if a maintenance is scheduled and we're predicting the pump is going to fail within the next two months, they'll go ahead and replace it. But whether it works or not, they're going to replace it because we're, we're, we're predicting it's going to fail. Because if it fails when, it, when they're not expecting it, it's $10 million a day to shut that well down. So uh, it's, it's very important to, to, to these, these companies to keep these things up and running. Now, the Internet of Things, the idea is everything you own has an IP address so that your refrigerator has an IP address and your toaster has an IP address. And so your refrigerator and toaster can talk to each other all day. So, <laughs> uh, but where, now this feeds into smart meters. Smart meters were this big thing that, that happened, oh, it's been four or five years ago, a, a number of power companies said, oh my gosh, we can, be, we can read meters every 15 minutes and uh, you know, get information about uh, usage of electricity. So there's a, a number of, uh, of uh, power companies that have, have, have added smart meters to the houses. So they, they are broadcasting out every 15 minutes about energy use uh, during that last 15 minutes. Well, it's a huge amount of data keeps piling up, and they don't know what to do with it. Um, the, but the, and about the best thing that we've been able to figure out so far what to do with it is use it to forecast energy demand over the next few days or next few hours so that if we, if we see that there's going to be a huge demand occurring that, that, and that demand is more than the supply that you've got and you're going to have to go out and buy it on the open market, it can be very expensive. Yeah. Instead of six or seven cents a kilowatt hour, something, they have to pay two or three dollars a kilowatt hour to, to buy up excess uh, power that is needed. So there's huge tra trading rooms that that's all they do for, for energy companies is, is to make sure that they've got the energy needed uh, and they, or they sell excess capacity that they have. But um, that's about the only thing it was good for, this, all these smart meter readings. But you see where they really come into play is when you have the smart meters and you have the Internet of Things on every device. So if all of a sudden you've got an energy uh, demand peak that's coming up, the power company will, will, might just call up your dryer and say, hey, shut off for a little while. I'll tell you when you can come back home. Uh, or you might just tell your refrigerator, uh, go into a defrost cycle right now. So uh, anything uh, to, or to cut your uh, dishwasher off. Uh, I'm sure there will either be laws that permit this or we're going to have to agree to it because we're going to get a better electric rate. But. Um, that's the long-term goal of the, the Internet of Things. I mean, you, you know, already you've got uh, uh, thermostats that you can control through your phone, or you've got uh, door locks or alarm systems that you can control through your farm, uh, to your, through your phone. But, uh, you know, eventually the idea is to, that everything is controllable. And uh, I think it'll be a damn mess. You know? <laughs> so we, we do want to open how do, it up. How do, I, how do you turn that light off again? <laughs> you know, we used to have these switches on the walls, but now it's got to go through the internet to talk to it. <laughs> so we do want to open it up for a few questions. Um, and we got some hands. Do we have a, a, do we want to get a mic to them, or are we just letting them yell it out, Ken? Yell it out. Let, yell it out. Well, I bought an airline one time. Uh, <laughs> that, didn't, that didn't turn out to it's called Midway Airlines. Uh, went bankrupt a few years back. Um, I, I bought, uh, we, we bought a few companies that uh, we didn't handle right when, when, when we bought them. We tried to integrate them right away. Uh, uh, now, if, if we ever do buy, and, and we do acquisitions every couple of years, we have learned to just leave them alone for a while, uh, maybe p pump them up with a little funding, a little, a little device, but not to, not to integrate them too rapidly. So, yeah, but the airline was the biggest. Yeah. You got another question? Yeah. So we're for an engineering consulting firm. We've been doing that for 30 years. Uh, we hire a lot of people from NC State, young engineers. Uh, with them comes new license for 
Well, as a matter of fact, um, we've recognized that uh, as, as an issue. Uh, right now, any student anywhere in the world can download a copy of SAS free of charge for, for, um, uh, for, for their machines. Uh, it's, um, we've, we, uh, since May, we've had 125,000 downloads. Uh, we have 20,000 students that are using um, our SAS on demand at, uh, at our headquarters in Cary. So uh, we are um, doing uh, an awful lot of work to put SAS in the hands of, hands of our undergraduates and graduate students. We've also um, now have 30 universities that we've helped start a Master of, uh, of Advanced Analytics degree. Our first one was here at NC State with uh, Michael Rappa's uh, group. And um, or he moved over there, didn't he? <laughs> OK, Michael. <laughs> um, He's graduating about 80 students a year uh, and uh, getting 800 applications for those 80, 80 slots. Uh, every one of his uh, student uh, graduates are, are getting two or three offers in, in the very high salary range. So uh, we recognize the problem. But uh, it, it, uh, it could be that some of the engineering departments think that this is a stat thing and they don't want to mess with it. But quite frankly, uh, about 80% of any any um, data analytical job is just getting the data ready or extracting the data from different sources and merging it or, or joining it together, whatever the, whatever word you want to use. And that's, uh, that's what is one of the great strengths of SAS is the ability to pull data together. So. Another question over here. <clears throat> Well, um, we, we've done, you know, again, just about every new drug in the, in the world is, goes through SAS analysis to, to be analyzed. Uh, we've helped sa save black rhinos uh, in, in Africa. Uh, we, uh, we, SAS has been used for a, a number of uh, humanitarian relief things. Uh, we're working with, uh, with the UN on uh, disaster relief as rapidly as possible after, after uh, tornadoes and uh, um, uh, and there we're using our visual analytics product to, to be able to spot uh, where, where the need is. Um, we're doing a, a lot of um, social media work there to, to, to be able to see what people are saying, uh, you know, what, kind, what kind of tweets are coming out of this area about the conditions there. Uh, so uh, th there are so many uses of, of SAS that, that people they, they, they use it, and we don't necessarily even find out about it for some number of years. I have a question on this side, over here. One way in the back. Um, do you still do any programming yourself, or have you transitioned into management? You will find me programming occasionally, yes. Um, I was just doing some. Um, work for our, our university edition uh, to, to, to show people how to do simulations of coin tosses or simulations of uh, dice rolls uh, to be able to create a data set of um, all sort of all, all, all possible permutations of, of a number or to uh, do any uh, number of combinations uh, com 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 combinations com calculations and those are not those are those are tough little problems, uh, but um, yeah, that's the latest thing I've done. Uh, He's actually being a bit humble, right? As I was running R and D, it was not a surprise to come in on a Monday morning and Jim having an email to me saying, "I solved this over the weekend." <laughs> right? So uh, more than once or twice that happened. Um, yes. Size that it is 
I think one of the, the, the first one of the first problems we ran into is um, uh, we sent our first secretary down to the A and P store to buy some some coffee, and uh, we gave her a check for twenty dollars, and uh, they wouldn't give her any change. So to rectify that, she picked up a bag of M and M's, and uh, that brought it up to near twenty dollars. So. Uh, uh, that came, that they, they lasted about a week, and then John Saul said, where are the M&Ms? So we had to go back and buy more. And uh, we buy two tons a year now. So, uh, <laughs> there's, uh, we are known for M&Ms. So anytime you come out to SAS, you're going to see M&Ms just about every, every break area. So, so Jim, before we, we call it quits for the evening, um, you're very passionate about education. What would you say, two things, I think, what would you say about education in general where you'd like for uh, these people to be engaged? And second, to the students, when they're thinking about um, their education and what's important to the high types of, of people that we're looking for, how, how would you coach them? Well, right now, we're looking at um, uh, 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 the country as a whole. Is, um, I say we need about 10% more college graduates in the STEM areas. Uh, we are uh, uh, falling behind in uh, innovation and creativity in this, in this country uh, because we are not producing uh, enough STEM uh, skilled uh, students. Uh, you know, it's not that they, they don't apply. And, uh, you know, I was, with, uh, I was talking with Louis Vega uh, on a panel. I was on, that was yesterday, I guess. It was just yesterday I was on a panel with him. We, we were talking about the fact that you get plenty of people into the engineering schools. But after a year, they discover, ah, these are tough courses, and they, and they tend to switch curriculums or, and to switch majors. Uh, we have got to do a better job in K-12 of preparing students to be more rigorous, to study harder. We've got to raise the bar on, on education in it's the whole country, uh, and, and especially here in North Carolina. Uh, we've had political changes with um, under uh, George Bush to um, have this no child left behind thing where everybody had to be uh, smarter than average. And um, so everybody kept moving the bar down and down and down so everybody could be past that bar. And it was left up to the states to set those bars themselves. And uh, we really need to make that correction to how we're teaching students. We need better teachers. We, our teaching uh, our colleges of education need to prepare our teachers better. They're still preparing them the same the way they did it 50 years ago. There's hardly any use of technology in uh, the training of teachers, uh, no use of data. Uh, there, uh, there are just huge needs in education if this country is going to stay ahead. So that's, I think that's really important for everybody to, to be on board with that message. But it, to the students specifically in computer science and the things that, that you're looking for in talent when you're, you're trying to find young people who really can engage, what, what would you tell them? Well, we want people that are passionate about programming, that, um, that, that, enjoy, um, that, that enjoy it, that, that, that are team, team players. Uh, you know, the, the, one of the problems, I think, in university, you spend a lot of your time working on stuff on your own. But when you come to work for SAS, you've got to work in a team. Uh, you've got to be able to uh, follow, the, follow the procedures and processes that, that are in place, and most of them are in place for a reason, because we've made these mistakes before and don't want to make them again. Uh, so it's a, it's a totally different environment, but uh, it, it, it's, a, uh, it's, it's a great environment. I think, I think all of you would enjoy, enjoy it. So. so I see Mladen standing over there with the hook, so I think we're about to get cut off for the evening. Right. So, how about a round of applause for Jim? Here?